Ahoy! The new New World patch just rolled out and I literally just woke up and haven't even had the chance to test anything, but the New World community team is not sleeping and they have posted another dev blog, which talks about all the current issues as well as more future plans and once again there's some very very exciting stuff in there. They're detailing a lot of the upcoming changes and that's what we'll look into. Now this post is very long and I will try and summarize it as best as possible while making sure that the information remains accurate. The first topic is server transfers. These should now be open to all players and New World is also working on a region to region transfer option but this will take more time. However, if you want to play with your friends there's something else to keep in mind and that is that a full server status now exists for very crowded servers. This one will prevent you from creating new characters, but there will be a 24 hour warning before a server is marked as full. So if your friends are on a popular server and you're planning to make a new character, then you have a little bit of a heads up if you might not be able to do that anymore. On the topic of economy and deflation, the devs say that they want a player driven economy with minimal NPC interaction where gold is valuable to all players, even end game players. They say that currently the economy is performing within acceptable levels. There is more money being created than there's being removed. However, there is a very distinct shift between the different levels. So the money generation is very high in the level 1 to 35 range, which is when you get a lot of low tier match that sell well, but more importantly you get a lot of gold from quests. It's decent in the 40 to 59 level range and it narrows at 60. So the more players will have a level 60, the more pressure will be put on the economy. And we can see that in these graphs, we can see the development of the economy over time. The devs are aware that this may become an issue and they're monitoring these values closely to make sure that you don't end up with more money leaving the market than entering the market per day. They recently made two changes which they think will affect this. The first one is enabling the tier 5 ALOS staff which they think is a good source of gold per hour. I'd argue it's not particularly effective, but hey, at least it's a way to get some gold. The more important one, in my opinion, is that they turned on Outpost Rush, which they talk about as well, which they say is a great source of income and will really help endgame players. And I agree with this, because Outpost Rush especially brings money into the economy from players that are not otherwise focused on generating money. It's a very easy way to do that, especially now if the issues are actually fixed. The devs also remind everyone that there's a big gold bonus, which is a 10 times gold bonus, for your first three faction missions each day. They're aware that this is not well communicated in the interface, so they're working on improving that. I actually wasn't aware of that, I thought it was just a faction token bonus. So yeah, the more you know. Given that some of the higher level faction missions actually have pretty decent base gold values, this should be a very good extra source of income if you consistently use this. However, there are further economy changes that are coming in the major release in November. We don't know when exactly that will be, it's not going to be a normal weekly patch, but this will change a lot about this as well. In that update, the durability loss from PvP death is reduced by 10%. I guess that actually refers to the total durability, which would mean that it's basically nothing at that point. But yeah, we'll have to see how exactly they're interpreting this 10% here. In the same patch, the housing tax period will also be extended from 5 to 7 days without increasing the amount that you have to pay, so that's going to be a little bit cheaper. The attribute respec cost being reduced by 6% is also mentioned here, but that actually already happened. At the same time, the amount of honey gained from apiaries and the amount of milk from the cows is reduced by 50 and 65% respectively, because there was just a little bit too much of it because people just picked it up all the time while in towns. A very important major change that is coming in that patch is that all trading posts will be linked. The notes that come along with this are Fees for buy and sell orders are defined by the settlement that you're posting from, which would mean that it makes sense to post from a settlement that your faction owns. And likewise, transaction taxes on purchases you make are defined by the settlement in which you are making the purchase. So buying and selling in your faction areas, I guess, or wherever it's cheap. Items listed in sell orders that expire are returned to the settlement from which they were posted. And also you can no longer place items on the trading post for 28 days, the maximum is now 14 days. 
These are obviously sweeping changes to the economy that will spread out the player base across all towns much more. Some people may stay closer to the high level areas now, especially if the faction owns something there, if the rates are good there. Then it also will make it so that it can't really be used to corner specific markets in specific areas anymore. Like for example, selling something that is needed for a quest in a specific area or selling something that is easier or harder to farm in certain areas. So I expect a lot of prices to actually drop a fair bit because everything's connected now and somebody will be in some place and have easy access to something at some point. I will say that I understand why this change was made, it just helps spread the economy across the world a lot more so that all territories can get a decent amount of income, but I think it will also spread out the player base and it kind of takes away a little bit from that, hey, we can still go to low level areas and have a purpose there once we're higher level because you still have your trading going on there. So we'll see how this develops, obviously some people will stay in certain areas for resources or because of their faction and so on. I think it's a change that definitely has pros and cons to it, but especially at the current state where you have those major trading hubs that just become more unstable because of it as well, it makes sense to space things out a little bit more, at least for now. Maybe at a later stage they can return to a more, well, somewhat secluded trading system, but then maybe spread out the income more or something. Uh, we'll see how that can be solved at that point, but for now I think this solution is probably useful, but I wouldn't necessarily look at it as the best permanent one. In the same breath, they announced more details about another change that I'm absolutely excited for, which is the cost reduction for Expedition Tuning Orbs, or Dungeon Keys. The coin gained from Expedition bosses starting at Starstone Barrels is increased by 25% and ramps up to endgame expeditions by 100% per boss. So the Expeditions may actually become a decent way to make money. Additionally, the coin cost of each of the Tuning Orbs will be reduced, and the number of corruption shards players earn from minor and major corrupted breaches will be increased. As of now, you don't earn any shards from minor corrupted breaches. So I'm guessing you will actually get shards from that now at a smaller quantity or a lower uh, tier basically, and you get more from the major ones as well. So it seems like they're not going to reduce the mat requirements, but instead give you more mats, which is a bit unfortunate for the people who have already been farming them for a long time, because they are not going to get much benefit out of this. But hey, at least it's improving in some way. The coin cost of shizzles has also been reduced by 20-50%, that also went through in this patch already. So all in all, running expeditions should be a lot more possible and a lot cheaper, so that's great. Also there were a few bugs with repair kits that are going to be fixed, one being that certain attribute perk mods could not be used in crafting repair kits, and the other one being that repair kits actually ended up costing you gold when used, and they should only cost gold uh, when being crafted, so that should be solved too. Next, the devs address economy exploits and coin farming. Here they just once again emphasize that a lot of these players that have exploited things have now been banned. Uh, they go into a variety of different details regarding that, but that is something they already kind of covered in the patch notes anyways, so I don't think that needs to be fully repeated here. But again, the gold that you gain in early game is shifted a little bit and you can not farm as easily with new characters now because you can't transfer as quickly uh, and people get punished for using any of the exploits to gain additional gold in any way. On the topic of Outpost Rush, there was an issue where a few players ended up in a permanent death state after Outpost Rush where they couldn't respawn, they couldn't unstuck or anything and they were just basically floating around in brimstone sands. This is something they still have an issue identifying and they're still trying to figure this out but it should be solved better now, usually a hard restart should fix it and if it doesn't fix it for you, submit a ticket and it should be addressed relatively quickly. The devs also address client-side versus server-side authority. This is a topic I want to address separately because I have seen some very interesting changes in that regard lately. The main takeaway from this is that they emphasize that basically almost all decisions are made server-side and there were some outlier cases where the server was waiting for an input from client-side that caused a variety of the issue that we have seen. These should be mostly resolved now according to them and we will see how that goes in the long run. Still some interesting stuff regarding that that I will talk about separate from this. On the topic of moderation and the code of conduct, they say that player reports are always going to a person and being reviewed. This is kind of contrasting with some earlier information that one of their previous employees uh, wrote on the forums, which caused a lot of confusion in that regard. So again, something that is really just not 
clear to us. We can't really know the full picture here because we don't have the internal insights. However, they're saying that they're increasing the number of moderators, they have a growing army of moderators, and they acknowledge that they can make mistakes too. They describe one scenario more specifically here, and that is mass reporting in the context of wars. What they say is happening that two rival groups will have confrontations in chat prior to a war or fight, and they try to goad each other into code of conduct violations and then report the person violating it and getting them banned before the war. They say, again, these suspensions are not driven by the volume of reports, but the legitimacy of the violation. This is obviously extremely hard to verify, and I can imagine many of those situations happening. But at the same time, we don't know what goes on behind the scenes here, and we basically have to rely on their word. They also say, we also take advantage of automated systems such as Easy Enter Cheat to detect and remove folks who are using cheats and exploits. This process is data-driven and automated, but this is unrelated to reports. This is something like, for example, if you still try to use trading exploits to get more gold. Then the devs address war lag. And in this context, they state that after tracking, what they have mostly found is that a lot of the war lag is caused by using exploits. This is frequently done by using the Ice Gauntlet, Fire Stuff or Life Stuff in order to create latency problems while capturing points. They made some initial changes that were achievable in short development cycles and are working on further updates with higher impact that need longer testing to preserve balance. I think one of the major problems with this is that what one company may use and exploit may be the legitimate tactic of another company. So say for example one company is using ice storms stacking on the point in order to lag out the point, that just happened plenty of times. And then another company decides, hey, we want to do AOE damage on the point in a very concentrated area to burst everyone in that area, without the intent of lagging that area. The result would still be the same, in both cases the point would lag out. In one case, people are trying to lag the point out, in another case, they're trying to run a strategy that revolves around big AOE in a concentrated area. This is even more obvious with Sacred Ground of the Life Staff. And I don't know in which of those situations the lag will be prevented or will be happening. I don't know how exactly it happens, like how concentrated, so for example, the ice stones would have to be to cause the lag. So it is a complicated one to even track for them, which makes it very, very easy to abuse for people who have malicious intent with this. And that makes the whole thing very messy. So really the only solution to this is for the devs to find a way to actually not make these AOE abilities lag out areas on the point. Especially with the last two points basically always being zerked, it's very hard to find a way to avoid this. And even then, even if you said, I'm just gonna run melees in my comp, that would still be a problem because you might have the same result from something like graph well. So yeah, I really hope they can find a permanent solution to this that just makes it so that abilities can be used in walls without causing lags in general. On the topic of invasion difficulty and participation, they just mentioned once again that the progress in an invasion does not affect the number of downgrades, but the number of downgrades are tied to the territory level. So the higher the level of your territory, the more downgrades you will get. They also state individually you will be more likely to get better awards the more you contribute to your team. So contribute to your fort's defense and make sure you're giving the corrupted all you got. This, again, super confusing to me because at the moment the way they measure performance in wars is absolutely atrocious from a tank perspective. Most of the stats that tanks have, like CC applied or damage blocked, doesn't even show up in the charts. So obviously you're not going to be high on the charts or have a high impact measurement under the current metrics. So I don't think this should be a thing at all. Additionally, they see the current issues of companies wanting to defend their own territory from invasion just with company members, and on the other hand, players wanting to participate in them and not wanting to be removed if they're not part of the company. So yeah, that's a bit of an awkward one, and they're trying to find a solution that works for both, apparently. On the topic of patch schedules and downtimes, they are trying to make it so that EU prime time isn't hit too hard and that they can ideally space out the updates for the most part so that they release at different times in different regions uh, depending on when there's the lowest usage in that region at any given point. Obviously this is not always possible with certain large updates but I do think that they have a relatively good approach with that so far. I know that Australia is usually the region getting shafted and they've been trying to avoid that sometimes giving us the patches a little bit later and stuff so that we don't get hit by it too hard so props to them for that. They're also trying to provide updates every Tuesday on the status of their weekly patch. Next, we have a bunch of smaller but very interesting segments. The first one of them is how does lock work? 
This one I will specifically read out. Recently, we have received a lot of questions about how luck works in New World. Luck of the general type, as opposed to the types of gathering luck you see, something like a sickle or a food buff, affects your chances to roll higher on our lists of items that come from enemies and containers like stockpiles. In the case of furniture schematics and found furniture items, the higher end storage items are among the most rare. Increasing your luck will definitely make this more likely to occur, but as with all luck, there's no guarantee you'll get it. Unfortunately, they don't go into the luck safe containers, which I wish they would do, which are not affected by luck. There's uh, so quite a few of them and that's a bit messy at the moment. On the topic of fishing chests, they removed the gold you receive from fishing chests due to issues with botting. They understand the impact of that and they are trying to explore opportunities to make fishing a rewarding experience for their players. Not sure how they're going to resolve that one. Very, very frustrating because obviously that was something that made fishing lucrative and rewarding while it was more of a niche profession for most. So yeah, I kind of wish they would solve that differently and just find a better way to ban the bots. But I guess with fishing that is relatively hard. On the topic of perks and gems, they say there are currently many issues with how perks and gems are functioning. For example, the resilient perk is granting damage absorption instead of critical damage absorption. They're looking into solutions for these type of things, because it's not intended behavior, and they will try and add it to their weak releases. They did that for Resilient already, even though that didn't quite work as planned from what I found out so far. And their goal is to have all issues with perks solved by their November monthly release. I highly doubt that is going to be possible, because there are a lot of issues with a lot of perks and a lot of gems. I think that is a very optimistic goal and I wish them good luck with that, but if they even solve half of them, that would already be pretty impressive at this point. There is a 250 strength bug that they're aware of, which causes you to no longer be able to dodge properly, there's a delay after abilities. They know this and the team is working on it. While the devs are going to change the time span of property taxes, they do not necessarily think that everyone is meant to have three nice homes across different parts of Eternum. So they say this is not meant to be easily achievable. So they will continue to monitor the feedback and data, but at the moment they don't see cause for change with this one. So maybe they just want you to have one big house and two smaller ones for now, unless you have particularly good reasons to have three. Next, I mentioned some things like the faction tokens bug, world clock bug, images in chat, and crouching bug. All of these seem to have been resolved at this point, however, so we don't really need to go in detail anymore. They were already addressed in previous patches and so on. The next segment, they address the high watermark system, but this is just a copy-paste of something they have previously already written down quite a few days ago. So that I'm not going to go into again, but they do address communication as well. After their relatively rocky start, they're trying to improve their communication. They introduced a deaf corner where you can see these types of updates, exactly like this one. They made a commitment to post a notice every Tuesday for the status of the weekly patches. And they will provide mega threads for every weekly update for feedback and bug reporting. They're also trying to generally communicate more frequently, something that was really noticeable across the past few days. I think it's very good that they're addressing the issues and they're talking about the plans or what they want to do with them. So I think in that regard, things are really moving in the right direction. And on the topic of other updates, they also posted separately, not in this particular article, but in a separate one, that family sharing on Steam will now be disabled to prevent it being abused by bots, gold sellers and ban evaders. They said this decision was not taken lightly and for players who utilize family sharing for a valid reason, we will update this post with instructions for your assistance. Though it seems like there should still be the possibility to somehow use this if you're actually a real person using this, but I would say 90% of the people using it were probably not real people or were abusing it in some way or another. So I'm glad that they're taking this step. This is what most of the people that are familiar with the duping things suggested saying there's basically no way around it because otherwise it's very, very easy to avoid bans. Though apparently they have banned the account that shared with the family sharing one in some cases as well. So we'll see if that is something that has happened on a larger scale. If you enjoyed the summary and you'd like to hear more like it, then please consider subscribing and clicking the bell so you get notified of upcoming videos. In the next days, we'll talk about an interesting way to make more void ore, as well as other high level mats. And we'll also talk about a lot more in-depth mechanic stuff that I've been testing. So 
you can look forward to that. I'm really excited about what's coming next. And obviously we'll also look a little bit further into the patch changes and what has actually changed and hasn't changed. Thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you for the next one soon. Duke Sloth, out.